Yeah. Welcome, everyone, um, to another uh, uh, session of Why Do Catholics uh, Do Blank, Blank, Blank. And today we're going to be talking about apostolic tradition. So last week, uh, those of you who were there, we spoke about the Bible. Today we're going to speak of the other half of the equation uh, for Catholics and, and talk about, as we have in all the other ones, first where it comes from in Judaism, uh, how it's lived in Jesus' own life, that of the early church, and ultimately uh, to us as Catholics. This one will, prob will take two sessions. Um, it's a larger one. And, but it also includes one of the other topics, which is the papacy. So in a sense, it's not really two, but is two because of how I put it together. So um, let me go ahead and pass it out, and then we'll begin with our opening prayer. And I'm going to uh, do a prayer from, I don't know how many of you know, uh, St. Claude de Colombière, a French uh, saint. Um, a lot of his writings had to do with uh, surrender to God, trust in divine providence, uh, confidence in the Lord. And so today I have a very small uh, one of his, which is ironically, he didn't name it this, but other people call it the prayer of despair, which I don't think it's a prayer of despair at all. But uh, it's really a prayer that um, focuses us on the fact that we often don't live up to the faith in the way we want to. So as the, as the handout's going around, let's just kind of quiet ourselves for a moment to place ourselves in the presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you have placed me in this world to show your mercy to others. Other people will glorify you by making visible the power of your grace, by their fidelity, by their constancy, by all of their great gifts. But for my part, I will glorify you by making known how good you are to sinners. For in my many failings, I see that your mercy is boundless and that no sinner, no matter how great his offenses, should ever have reason to despair of your pardon. If I have grievously offended you, my Redeemer, let me not offend you evermore, and be kind enough to continue to pardon me as I fail throughout this life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. So last week we spoke about the Bible, which is one of the, there's really kind of a tripod of um, Catholic understanding. And before I get into the handout, I want to just make a few little comments and kind of set up a sort of a beginning for us. The first thing to recognize is this. In the Bible, at least in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, um, Um, there it is. In the New Testament, all three of these words are synonymous. Word of God, the theologoi, gospel, evangelion, good news, tradition, paradosis, which means to hand on, receive. They're all used interchangeably and synonymously by the authors. The other thing that's very important for us as Catholics to recognize is this. The way most of us have probably think about what, what we think about when we hear the word of God is probably very Protestant influenced. That is, we hear the term word of God, we think of the Bible. The truth is, the Bible is never called the word of God in the Bible, ever. Only the oral tradition is ever called the word of God. So in the Old Testament, you have the prophets, the word of the Lord, right? the Dabar Yahweh came to me. Um, so the term word of God means literally the spoken word that the prophets have received from the Lord. And then later it comes to mean Christ himself as literally the word of God incarnate who has come in the flesh. Calling the Bible the word of God doesn't begin until about after the Council of Nicaea in the 300s. Then you start seeing certain church fathers refer to it as the word of God. And there's probably a lot of reason for that. Um, one is, as we learned last week, the Bible, at least the New Testament, did not come to be in the 27 books we know it um, until the, the 200s or so. And so it would be, um, they wouldn't have had anything to specifically call the word of God that would have been agreed upon that was written down. So as time went on, 
it becomes used as the Bible as well, but the original sense and the sense in which the church still uses it today refers to the entire revelation of God, of which there are two channels. All of it is called tradition, all of it. Some tradition has over time come to be written down. And that's the scriptures, sacred scriptures. Other tradition was passed along orally by the life, the example, uh, the teachings of the apostles. And that's referred to as apostolic tradition. Now, today, just as what happened in Judaism, today there is no oral tradition in the strict sense that there's anything that's just orally transmitted that has not been written down. But those writings now are not considered, are not the same as the Bible. Those are the writings of the fathers, the um, creeds, the different liturgical texts of the first and second centuries, um, the um, uh, decisions of the ecumenical councils. So all of it has been written down, but it comes from a different, it, it, it came, was passed on through a different way. So in truth, the whole Bible or the whole Christian tradition was entirely oral. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament. So anything about the church was completely oral. So everything comes out of the quote, big tradition with a big uh, capital T, some of which, as we said, becomes written down and therefore becomes very normative because it is written down. And some will remain oral for quite some time, only being written down sort of as the centuries progress. Now there is a third component uh, and it is part of the pyramid, but I don't like to put it in part of the pyramid so that people don't misunderstand. But that is, everything that happens was sent by Christ and is kept alive in his church by the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about this as we look through the handout. So it's the Spirit who inspired the Bible. That's what inspired means, inspirited. And it's the Spirit who brings forth the oral tradition. Right? At the Last Supper, he will continue to lead you into all truth the apostles, and it's the same spirit that Jesus also bestowed in a special way upon his apostles. The technical term is the magisterium. It just means the teachers, the teaching function of the church. And so the magisterium is the interpreter and the custodian of the tradition. They themselves are not the word of God, but they are the ones who give the authoritative and ultimately definitive um, understanding of either scripture or the oral tradition. So it's kind of like a little tripod as Catholicism understands it. And this is exactly the same as, as Judaism does to this very day, the same three ideas. You have the oral Torah, you have the written Torah, and then you have the rabbinic um, schools of thought that oversee how the things are interpreted. And that would make sense because Catholicism understands itself, and this is what the Bible presents Christianity as, as the fulfillment and perfection of Israel. Now, it's the perfection of Israel in the sense that it brings about what Israel was created for. The church is certainly not perfect in the sense that it has reached its perfection yet, but it is filled with the Spirit of God. It is the body of Christ. It is the church called out by the Father, and it is the one that will... Uh, lead into the, the second coming. So the idea being, if we are the fulfillment of Israel, then when we look back as Christians at the Old Testament, it should look similar to us. That is, the two should parallel each other. Yes, there's going to be differences because of Jesus, but most of what Jesus did was restore and perfect things that were already there. So for example, you go into a Catholic church, you see a tabernacle, you see an altar, you see priests, you see incense, you see these different things. We look back to the Old Testament and you have priests, altars, tabernacles. And if you go to a synagogue, they still call the table, although it's obviously they don't do sacrifice anymore because the temple is gone, but that's still called the bema, which means the altar in Hebrew. And our tabernacle comes from Judaism. If you've ever been inside a, a synagogue, there's going to be a thing right behind the bema, gold and everything else. And instead, instead of 
the body of Christ, they have in there the handwritten Torah scroll. To this day, every synagogue must have a handwritten Torah scroll. So that's what's kept there to sort of symbolize God's presence. But the point being, we should expect a familiar process, a similar thing to undergo um, in the history of the church as we've seen what occurred sort of in the first covenant. So with that, let's kind of start off real basic of sort of looking at what tradition is, and then we'll start by looking at what Israel understands um, oral and, and written tradition. So the word tradition simply means to hand on and receive something. So it refers both to the process, I'm handing on something, the next generation or the next person is receiving it, and it also refers to the content, what is being handed on, what is being received. And so it's the means by which our divine revelation and the grace that accompanies it has been in history concretely mediated, that is brought forth, taught, internalized, and lived out by the church in each generation. So for example, the, the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia of Doctrine uh, states this, right at the top of page one. It says, quote, sacred tradition expresses the normative historical record of God's creative and salvific saving interaction with the world. And then as I already pointed out, the church teaches that divine revelation, the word of God, is contained within two types or modes of expression. One written, the sacred scriptures, and one unwritten, the sacred apostolic tradition. And as I mentioned, that same spirit continues to direct the Catholic Church in grasping these divine mysteries more clearly over time. Every Christian church, as far as I'm aware, whether they're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, as far as I'm aware, all hold to the same idea, and that is with the death of the last apostle, there is no more revelation. It is done. And there will be no more revelation until the second coming. What occurs between now and the second coming is we have what's been given, but in each generation as we go through it, as we live it more, as we pray it more, as we delve into it more and contemplate it, those mysteries that were revealed at the beginning in the tradition in that first century of Christianity become more and more widely understood, grasped, etc. So we understand it more. So in that sense, there is development, but it's simply like that of an, uh, an acorn to an oak. Everything that develops in the church was there from the beginning. It may look very different, just as an acorn looks nothing like an oak tree, but everything is there. So the same spirit is the one who's directing this process through time from the first generation and then continually helping the church move forward in that to understanding what has been revealed. So we see just one example of this near the bottom, the indented paragraph of Jesus speaking to the apostles at the Last Supper. And he tells them, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me, because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I told you he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So as he's nearing the end of his earthly existence at the Last Supper, the Lord turns to the apostles and tells them he has a lot more, right? Much more, a lot more than these gospels record to tell you. But you can't bear it now, right? They're not in the spiritual uh, mindset where they can really grasp what's happening, right? They're gonna, be t they're gonna be undergoing a great trial that very night and the next few days as Jesus is arrested, uh, tortured, and killed. And so, but he tells them, but the spirit of truth will guide you to all truth. And earlier in the supper, Jesus had already mentioned that the advocate, the other helper was coming who would continue to guide into truth. And the spirit glorifies Jesus by helping us remember what Jesus' words are. But this is remembrance in the same way that we talk about the Eucharist. We come to mass and we hear those same words spoken by Jesus, now spoken through the priest, do this in memory of me. The term for memory there in the, in the Hebrew understanding is, and this goes back to Passover again, everything we have is ultimately Hebrew, just expanded upon. 
For example, today, when Jews celebrate the Passover, they absolutely believe, at least if they're religious Jews, they absolutely believe that what occurs to them at that Passover is the same grace and liberation that occurred all those thousands of years ago in Egypt, that they are truly become God's people more, more closely, that they are brought under his protection, that evil is being judged, who have tried to destroy the chosen people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a real bringing the past into reality. It's not just remembering back with kind of a fondness or nostalgia. It's making what happened then actually present again now. It's exactly what we think of in the Eucharist. So when he says, do this in remembrance of me, it's the same idea that he's talking about here. What the Spirit does is it takes the words of Jesus that were spoken so long ago and it makes them alive again now. First, it makes us even recall them by keeping them alive in the written scriptures, in the tradition, in the teachings. And then it continues to work to helping us understand what those words mean, to make them living and effective for us now. They're not just nice past teachings. They literally have the power to transform us because they are the very teachings of the incarnate God himself. So um, this whole understanding is very mystical. And that's one thing that I don't set out as a specific topic for Catholicism. But Catholicism is very mystical uh, from its very roots. It's very connected. It's very contemplative, right? The mass to an outsider or a person who doesn't grasp it seems very boring and repetitive. You just do the same things and then there's slightly different readings. You're just doing the same thing over and over. And there's times of silence and there's times of uniting with the angels in heaven. And that's because the whole point of it is, is this mystical understanding that at the mass, and we'll talk about this when we get into the sacraments next time, um, at the mass, heaven and earth are joined together. That's what the scriptures tell us throughout it. Israel believed they, they worshipped in a model, an image of what heaven's worship looked like. And we'll look at that um, throughout the whole book of the Exodus when God tells Moses to make anything, the ark, the tabernacle. He says, he keeps telling him this phrase, make it according to the vision I showed you on the mountain. 32 times it occurs in the book of Exodus. 32 times. So Jews believe that what the temple looked like, at least in some earthly sense, symbolizes the pattern that's heavenly. But then when we get to the New Testament, it changes. Because we have the Holy Spirit, because we are connected with Christ, when we worship, when we celebrate the sacraments, we're not worshiping a copy of what it looks like. We are actually there. Right? That's why the Mass says, right before the stuff, we join into the angelic hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy. Because those are the words only until the time of the church spoken by the angels. Right? In the book of Revelation, in the book of Isaiah, that's what the angels constantly revolve around God praying. And we have the story of, of uh, Paul being caught up into heaven and seeing the worship. The whole book of Revelation is John experiencing what he saw in the heavenly worship. And in fact, what John sees is what our church is based on. So John sees four things. And to be an active Catholic church from the smallest chapel to the largest cathedral requires four things. He sees an altar. He sees a book. He sees the lamb that is dead but alive. And he sees a throne. So on every, in every Catholic place of worship, there must be the altar, there must be the priest's chair, which is why you get the term deacon's bench, because that was just a little thing to differentiate him from the one who really represented Jesus. There must be a crucifix on the altar. Now, a lot of times one is already on the, um, on the altar itself, or I should say in the, in the sanctuary. Uh, most churches, of course, have the huge crucifix behind. If for whatever reason they didn't, then one has to be carried up in procession and placed there. And most churches do both. So here at San Rafael, we do both. One is carried up, and there's already one there. That represents the lamb that was slain but alive. And then finally, there's the um, book. That's the ambo has to be up there, where the, the gospel is read from, the holy book. That's why technically, and I know some churches fudge on this, but technically... 
Nothing should ever be done from the ambo except the homily and the psalm by the cantor. Any other announcement should actually be read from somewhere else, like a microphone where the musicians are and such, be to differentiate that this is not just the place for normal earthly things, like when the bake sale is or my Bible study, right? That goes over here. This should only be the word of God and the homily that the priest is explaining the word of God. But so um, the idea being this mysticism. So we have to, as Catholics, we have to kind of embrace this mysticism, right? We say every moment of every day, Christ is present in that tabernacle right now. And he's made present again every single time we celebrate that mass in a, more, in a unique way. So our whole life is filled with the supernatural. And we need to sort of embrace that more um, to understand, you know, the, the depths and the riches of our faith. So let's then take a step back and look historically at where this whole idea comes from, which as I've already uh, mentioned, is not ultimately Catholic, but Jewish. And you could almost, I can almost write the exact same um, little pattern on the board, except we just have to change the words a little bit. So what Jews believe, and this is true of all Jews today, it doesn't matter whether they're reform, conservative, Hasidic, irrelevant. They may differ on specifics, but they all would agree on this. And what is that? At Sinai, when God gave Moses the Torah, he gave him the complete Torah was both written, the Ten Commandments and the little that was first written, as well as being oral that there was an oral tradition that went with the written documents as well in order to understand them, to interpret them, to grasp them, and to pass them on. Um, so for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, in one of the very last chapter, 32, uh, this is on page two, um, in the very last chapter, Moses knows he's going to be dying soon. He will not be allowed to enter the promised land because of his sin. So Deuteronomy is, is called the second law because it's really Moses giving his last will and testimony. The laws in Deuteronomy are not directly from God. They are all from Moses with his authority from God. So that's why they're also called the second law. That's why they can be done away with. Remember, Jesus has the argument later. He says, well, what about marriage? What did Moses tell you? And by Moses, he means the book of Deuteronomy. Well, the book of Deuteronomy says you can divorce your wife. And then he says what? But in the beginning, it wasn't so. And he refers back to Genesis, which is part of the Torah too. Showing that Deuteronomy, for, even today for Jews, is not the same equivalent as the other four of that five book series. Anyway, what does Moses tell them as he's about to pass away? He says, quote, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of generations past. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. Right? He's referring to make sure you keep this oral tradition alive. And the oral Torah was passed on from disciple to student. First and primarily within the priestly community of the Levites, and especially the high priests and the priests. Then later it would be broadened to include the prophetic circles, the prophet groups, and the scribal schools. The oral tradition of Israel that exists has all been written down by today. It was written down after the destruction of the temple. So last week, if you want to connect it, the same event that led to Israel having to decide which books were actually the Torah, that was also the time that they began to write down the uh, oral tradition out of fear that it would become lost because so many of the priests and other people have died. The oral tradition... The original book is called the Mishnah, but the Mishnah is now part of a bigger work, which is all the commentary on the Mishnah, which is called the Talmud, which most people have probably at least heard the term. I have the Talmud on an electronic version. I love regular books more than electronic stuff, but that one's a little bit beyond my reach. It's thousands of dollars because it's 37 volumes long. Wow. Okay? It's huge. 
and it's in the Mishnah is the core, and then there's other books. You'll hear other terms, and so they're not really important for us here. But how does the Mishnah begin? Well, right in the middle of page two, the indented paragraph, this is a quote from the very first verse of the Mishnah. This is how it starts, telling that it's the oral tradition. It says, quote, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and gave it over to Joshua. Joshua gave it over to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets gave it over to the men of the great assembly. That's the Sanhedrin that Ezra started, if you remember last week, after the um, temple. They would always say three things, be cautious in judgment, establish many pupils, and make a safety fence around the Torah. So you have, from the beginning in Israel's thought, and up till this very day, there's the understanding that the oral tradition is sort of the real means by which a person understands the Bible. If you know any Jewish friends today who are religious, their knowledge of the written scriptures will probably be very small compared to their knowledge of the oral tradition, the Jewish laws, because that's simply how it's gone over time. The oral tradition has come to be more important in the sense of living out your daily Jewish life, especially because many of these laws can no longer be followed unless a new temple gets built anytime soon. So the oral tradition in Judaism has become sort of the focus. It is important to realize, though, that even though for its time period, Judaism was a very literate culture, overall, Judaism was still an oral culture, as all ancient cultures were. And for that, I want to stop for a moment. This isn't in the notes, but I, I want to make something very clear. Um, as modern 21st century Westerners, full of our technology and such, we hear terms like oral tradition, and we think, a lot of us, like that stupid telephone game you played in kindergarten, where I like come over and I whisper something in Dave's ear and he does it, and it goes back to Quinn and she tells me and it sounds nothing like what I started it, right? That's not oral tradition, okay? Oral culture's memories are so much greater than ours by far. I've seen my own memory decline, and I don't just mean because I'm getting older, because our technology weakens that, right? When I was 10 years old, I seriously probably had memorized 200 phone numbers, addresses, everything. You had to, right? Um, unless you carry on a big book with you. Nowadays, maybe three. I might know three. I, I can't recall my own cell phone's number often. I mean, I have to like look at it sometimes. So our memories get worse as we allow technology to do things. And I'm not making any statement about that. I'm just pointing out we can't use our experience to think about the oral law. Or then we fall into a weird Protestant trap of, well, it's all just kind of made up stuff through the centuries. No, not at all. I personally know two Muslim men today who can recite the entire Quran, first verse to last, from memory. And there are multiple rabbis who can still do that. Now, part of it is the languages give us that. But in the Middle Ages, most of the people like Aquinas and such, they're not quoting from a Bible they have written in front of them. They're often quoting everything from memory. Uh, Bonaventure and Aquinas would be able to write multiple books at once. They would put four secretaries in the corners. And you'd go to the first one, you'd say, book one, chapter one. Then you'd go to the second one, book two, chapter one. By the time you got around, you knew exactly where you were. Book one, chapter two. That's how they were to write so many books at a time when it wasn't you know, feasible to be able to print or anything, couldn't print or anything else. So please don't think that the oral Torah is kind of the ancient equivalent of our telephone game. The memories that are passed on are solid. They're, they're well known. And because they're repeated so often, everyone knows them. In other words, if you tried to change it, the audience would react. They're going to know something's off. Now, at the same time, for the non-essential parts, yes, there's a lot of freedom. So, for example, in Jesus' own stories, you know, Jesus didn't sit down and just do the Sermon on the Mount one time. He probably taught that every single village he went to. So Matthew takes it and he changes the context stuff, puts it on a mountain, does all the things to make sure it connects with Moses. Luke takes the same one and puts it on a flat plain to indicate that Jews and Gentiles are equal now as they hear it. So they, the, the, the non-essentials can be changed, but the story can't be. If someone totally made up their own Beatitudes or something, the community would say, well, wait, 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 we never heard that one before. 
So just recognize that the oral tr tradition, um, as it was passed on, is actually very, very precise. Yeah. When they said that Jesus taught with authority, was that kind of bucking that, that oral tradition? To some extent, yeah. He's going to place his own authority beyond that of the scribe. He's going to connect himself more with Moses, and then we're going to see even beyond Moses itself. Um, we're going to get to Jesus' view of the oral tradition in a moment, which is um, a lot more complex than we initially kind of uh, think of. Um, Isaiah speaks of this process. So um, much after the Torah, this is actually with the destruction of the temple, um, he talks about the word of the Lord that it's actually God speaking through him to the people of what they need to do. And he refers to the oral tradition because, again, the written Torah, most people couldn't read anyway. It's got to be the oral laws and things have happened. What does he say? It's the top of page three. He says, quote, This is my covenant with them, which I myself has, have made, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouths of your children, nor the mouths of your children's children, from this time forth and forever, says the Lord. Right? Pass down the oral tradition. Teach it to your children, who teach it to your grandchildren, who teach it on and on and on. Um, I forget which saint it was, but uh, one of the saints said, you know, God has no grandchildren, only children, because each generation has to take the word that is given to them by God and live it out. And therefore, each generation is always one step away from annihilation. Right? If you don't pass it on, it's gone. It'll be gone. So it's, it's important to keep the faith alive in each generation. Now, what did the oral law actually consist of? Well, a lot of stuff, but three primary things. The first thing is, is called the laws given to Moses at Sinai. Now, this can be confusing. And until I went through some Jewish studies with some rabbis, I would have totally misunderstood this and think they were basically just talking about the laws in the Bible. They're not. They're talking about laws that were given directly to Moses in order to interpret and understand um, the laws in the Bible, many of which don't make a lot of sense on the, on the surface. Right? Why can't you, like what's the big deal about um, uh, cooking a, a, a goat in its mother's milk? And why, what is really important about putting on these leather straps called tefillim, uh, the way that you do them? Why do you do that? So, that, so these are the laws that explain the laws. Um, because in Jewish understanding, Christianity didn't really carry this over, although we do, have, we do have parts of it. But in Jewish understanding to this day, there are three types of commands that the Lord has given in his Torah, whether oral or written. Um, The first level is the law. This is all explained in your footnotes too, but the laws are those laws that God gave Israel, which any human being would be able to figure out on their own, even if God hadn't given them, right? Like murder is a bad thing. But by doing it, God places his absolute authority and prohibition or expectation on these things. So there can't be any waffling within Israel or the chosen people. Uh, but there are things that could be discovered and are discovered all the time by human reason. We can fully grasp them. In fact, we don't need God to tell us, hopefully, most of us. Now, then there's a middle level called the testimonies, which are things that are totally rational, but they're not necessarily anything human beings would have just come to on their own. But once they understand what's being asked, then it makes sense. Oh, that's a rational kind of um, thing. The decrees are non-rational. What they mean by that is, these are things that no one can understand except God. In, that, in those occasions, all we do is obey. Because while it may seem odd to us of why you can eat one food as opposed to another type of animal, why you have to wrap leather things around your hand, the tefillim, why you have to do these certain things, make no logical sense to us. Everything that God asks of us has a repercussion in the spiritual world. 
So even though we may not know what that is directly, it happens. So as silly as it may seem, God never asks us to do anything just to see if we obey. Everything he asks of us has some effect that it causes in the world. And so um, that's one of the things that's outlined in the oral tradition is which ones are which. Um, like I said, we don't really have that as, in Christianity, although we do have smatterings of it. For example, the Eucharist, right? Do this in memory of me. And then in John 6, he talks about, Jesus talks about, um, he talks about himself being the bread that came down from heaven. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he says that. And if you remember the story, the Jews, for John, whenever he says the Jews, everybody there is Jewish. He's just referring to Jews who are not followers of Jesus yet. So all these Jews who have come for the miracles, Jesus says this, and they start to murmur, right? They're starting to look at each other and go, what is this man talking about? Now, Jesus hears their murmuring. He says, the very next verse, he says, stop murmuring. But you would... What he does then is kind of unexpected, not to us now as Christians, but at the time. Because in any other situation where Jesus talked in symbolic language, he explained it, right? He'll tell people, you know, there's four kinds of seed, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, what does that mean? And he's all, okay. The sower is God. The first type of seed is this person. The second type of seed, you know, or actually the field, what, it, what it's, anyway, he explains it. Not only does he not do that, he makes it harder. He says, um, stop murmuring among yourselves. In Greek, the word changes. And we don't catch this in English because I don't think we really have a word for it. But in Greek, he changes from the generic word to eat in the second time he, he says it to a noun or a, a verb that only can be used of animals chewing. So... Isn't there a word like masticate? Isn't that what it means for a, chew, a chewing cud? Or, or something? Yeah, there's, we do have a word, but it's not one. That's the word Jesus uses, right? In other words, not to, not to only not say it's not symbolic. He puts it right in their face, as graphic as you can be. No, I literally mean it. You have to eat this. And that's when they flip out and they say, this can't be. And so they leave. And then for the only time in the entire Bible, there are people who are already followers of Jesus who leave. It says, then many of disciples said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? They left and they went back to their former ways of life. Right? They left, they ceased to be followers. They couldn't believe the real presence. It's so important Jesus turns to the 12. He's ready to start over if he needs to. And he says, what do you say? Does anyone remember what Simon Peter's answer is? Where, we where, else we where else do we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe you are the Messiah. So that's this, right? What's Simon Peter's answer? I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Jesus. I only believe it because I believe who you are. I've seen what you can do. But that's a decree. We will never grasp the Eucharist, right? The seven-year-olds that Quinn teaches for First Communion, what do you basically have to know to take communion? At this moment, it's bread and wine. After the priest says these words, it's his body and blood. Great. I've had a lot of theology. I don't actually understand it any better than the kids do Right? We have words, transubstantiation. Anyone really know what that means or feels transubstantiation? No. Right? It's a mystery. And so we do have these things in Christianity, just not we haven't worked out ideas to it the way that Judaism did, nor do we have nearly as many. But we at least kind of can understand where Israel's coming from. So that's one part. Yeah. I read, I think it was in this day, a mm -hmm. comment on the Eucharist, and it said the reason that it's bread and wine is because society could not accept the fact that they would give you a piece of raw flesh that was bleeding. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so they had to, God had to put it into a form right. that was tolerable. Right. I mean, there is a lot. I mean, there's, that's why it's a mystery. There's more and more we can understand about it, but never fully really grasp it. I mean, the greatest saint doesn't really grasp the idea much better than the seven-year-old. 
they might be able to experience it in a different way because of their faith and everything else, but to truly understand it, because it's directly something from the Lord himself. In fact, it is the Lord himself. So, um, but the three parts are, so those are the laws given to Moses. Then, in order to help understand these things, the laws given to Moses, the second thing that's in the oral Torah is what's called the 13 principles. So if you were to just Google the word 13 principles Jewish, it would pop up and you'd have the list of them. Now, they're not listed that way in the Torah, um, in the oral Torah now written down, they're all over the place, but there are these 13 rules that are brought together on how you interpret things. Now, the Jewish understanding of their uh, scriptures is, is very different from what we understand. And the Hebrew language is unique. Um, it's first of all unique because it is the first language that we have any awareness of which means it's probably correct. It's the first language where letters stand for sounds. Every other written language before that, every word was a picture. Think of it, the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the pictographs in China, all the things. Hebrew is the first letters that letters mean sounds. They also mean numbers. And so in Jewish understanding to this day, Hebrew is not just the human language spoken by the Hebrews. Hebrew is the language God spoke everything into existence. And so Hebrew is literally the divine language. That's why a lot of things can only ultimately be done in Hebrew. That's why, you know, even for your short bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, you have to memorize that verse and it has to be entirely in Hebrew. So the Hebrews, they're each of their, they have four parts to their, um, um, Hebrew is a very interesting language. Um, each letter So let's take the letter uh, Ta. Hebrew has only consonants. There are no vowels. What that means is one word in Hebrew or one string of letters in Hebrew could be thousands of words. Because right? you're going to have just the continent, consonants. So by adding what are called the pronunciation marks, then you change the word. So that you can put, you know, I can put something behind it, I can put something in front of it, and now I have a whole different word, a whole different word. It's open-ended, Hebrew. Because it's only consonants, there's no way, by just looking at it, reading it, there's no way to know how to pronounce it. There's no vowels or anything, so you don't know what word it is. So you have to learn what's called the cantillation, that each letter has multiple sounds, not just one. Um, kind of like our long and short vowel stuff, but much more extensive. I'm not even going to try to explain it. But it's chanted. Hebrew is chanted. In fact, probably the best translation for the first book of Genesis, when God spoke, is actually God sang or God chanted. He's chanting Hebrew and making the world into existence. Um, so you have pronunciation marks, you have these cantillation marks, you have the letter, and then you have what are called the crowns. In old, in old Bibles, English Bibles, you heard that weird word, jot and tittles. Has anyone ever, or am I completely alone here? <laughs> and some, you, you hear these weird, for, the King James used it, I think even the Dewey Reams used it in English. It, it comes from Jesus' statement, not every jot and tittle of the law will not pass away until everything has taken place. Now, what are the jots and tittles? Well, they're called crowns. And this is really hard. And you probably won't get it. It took me a long time to understand it too, but just sort of go with it. 
these crowns look like little tiny circles attached with a line. And then there's a few other variations. And depending where they are put on here, they give completely additional meanings to that word. So this might mean take this word and flip it over and now read it backwards and now you've got a whole other word and then put them together and then that's the sentence. So you can read every Hebrew sentence, word, letter, etc. front, back, up, down. It, it's, it's crazy. Um, but what these are understood to be is each one of these is an extra explanation of the oral law about that written law. That's, where the, that's what the term means. So when Jesus refers to that, he clearly is talking about the oral law. We'll look at that passage in, in a few moments. The point being, Hebrew is a really complex language. Uh, not only is it hard to learn because it obviously doesn't use our alphabet in any way or shape, um, but it's difficult because you wouldn't know how to pronounce it unless someone teaches you. There's no way you could just know because of, of the strange way in which the Hebrew language goes. So the oral law also explains all the permutations, variations, etc., of all these laws that are listed. So, for example, you know, the law in the Bible, the sentence might say, um, I don't know, um, here are, you know, don't do any work on the Sabbath. That's a good one. Don't do work on the Sabbath. Okay, what does that mean? And all these letters will then have multiple crowns all over them. And each crown is supposed to represent a permutation where you change enough of the letters, change the consonants, flip it around, do this, where you can get every teaching you want out of that. So you flip the word and then it says toilet. So you can't flush toilets on the Sabbath. You flip a word or you change the word from the crown. It says it. So it actually explains what the law is. I know it is really kind of trippy, actually. Uh, so much so that St. Bonaventure, the, the Catholic saint, believed Hebrews was the language of God. That that is the divine language. He says it's not Latin, and it's not Greek. It's definitely Hebrew. Uh, the other thing about Hebrew is that, um, it, and we're, fami we'll, uh, we're familiar with this from like Roman, uh, the Roman alphabet as well, and that is, Every Hebrew letter, there are 22 letters in Hebrew, has a number correspondence. So um, just like in Roman numerals, right, that's the letter I and one. Hebrew has that for everything as well. And so there is also in this oral tradition, we'll see all these, you, you, if you read scripture long enough, you hit the numbers, right? Three is a big one, four, six, seven, 8, 10, 12, um, about 40, and then 1,000. Those are the main ones. There's other ones too, but those are the big ones. Or a permutation of these. So 3 times 3 is 9, or if you have the number 9, that would be 3, 3, so Trinity. So that's another thing. Um, so these numbers also now, now you have letters that mean numbers. So you can actually assign a number to every word, right? Every letter, every word. And then you find that number elsewhere in the Bible and they connect. So this, you know, I have this word and it adds up to the letter 40. Then I find everywhere the letter 40 is, I'm going to find a similar word or a similar idea. So, you know, it gets crazy. I'll stop in a moment, believe me. I know everyone's like, what is this? But I just want to point for a simple example out. Hebrew has no superlatives. You can't say something is good, better, and best in Hebrew. It's impossible. All you can say is something is good. So if I want to say something is better, and I was speaking Hebrew, I say it's good, good. And if I want to say something is the very best, it's good, good, good. That's why we still have the holdover in our mass. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Right? So even before the Trinity, three was representative of God because it was also representative of the best, of perfection, of greatness. It's as high as you could go, so to speak, spiritually. Then we come in seven, three plus four, so three is God. Four is the number of the earth, 
because remember the earth symbolically is seen as a flat altar and we still think of it that way even though we don't we know it's round but we have how many directions four right can't have directions on a round globe but that's okay north south east west so the earth is four so you add them up and you get seven so we have seven sacraments because the number itself tells you what a sacrament is it's the union of god his grace coming through earthly things water wine bread oil human beings so seven so seven is also this number of completion right the seventh day of rest um, seven sacraments seven virtues seven right, how many continents do we say there are seven there's not not if you really connect a completely connected landmass a continent there's only about five right because europe asia and africa are really one so why do we call it seven because of christianity it's complete in the ancient world you heard of the seven seas there's way more than seven so it's completion however seven collapsed adam and eve didn't reach that for humanity and so they fell therefore eight means the new creation or the new beginning so Hebrew boys must be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. St. Peter in his letter makes a huge deal that eight people were saved in the ark, right? A new beginning. Jesus' name in Hebrew adds up to eight. David's name in Hebrew adds up to the number eight. Hebrew festivals last eight days. Passover is one day of Passover, followed by seven days of unleavened bread. Eight days. Jewish weddings in the first century lasted eight days, which is why Jesus had to fill the wine up if it was already running out very early. Okay, so eight is the new beginning. Now, let's go back to six for a moment. Does anyone recall what was created on day six, symbolically? Humans. Humans. What else? <coughs> we weren't alone. Same day. Anyone Animals. Remember? Animals. Animals. The birds and the fish were created earlier. The animals are created on day six. So now, kind of understanding G, uh, Hebrew symbolism, six is imperfection, right? It's not there yet. It hasn't reached completion. So you have imperfection is the number six. But there's three of them, which means it's perfect, Imperfection, the worst of the worst, the Antichrist. And what is his title? The beast. Because he exists as those on the sixth day who choose not to enter into the Sabbath of God, but to live like an animal, right? Just based on pleasure and senses. So all the numbers that we hear all have a, a, a basic meaning, and then they're used throughout the Bible to explain that. So that just adds a whole nother layer. So when you, when you start to see the complexity of the Hebrew alphabet just by itself, you at least can appreciate what they understand the oral tradition does. It explains all of these things. And then finally, authoritative edicts. In other words, what the uh, priests and such have come up with over time because they had, that, uh, they had the um, power from God given in the, in the written Torah to make those rules. So now let's jump ahead with this oral Torah to Jesus' time. So we're in the first century, Jesus, page four. By the time of Jesus, the authority to make to interpret the oral law rested with the Sanhedrin, the group that would ultimately convict Jesus to death from the Jewish side. Mm -hmm. They have this written in the Torah. Quote, a person should not say, I won't fulfill the mitzvah, that's commandment, the word for commandment. I won't fulfill the commandment of the elders since they are not from the Torah, meaning the written Torah. The Holy One, blessed be he, tells such people, my children, you are not permitted to speak this way. Rather, all that they decree upon you, you should fulfill, as it says in my Torah. You shall do according to the Torah that they teach you. Jesus teaches this, remember? They sit on the chair of Moses, so do everything they tell you 
but don't follow their example because they preach, but they don't practice what they preach. But you have to do what they say. They still speak with the authority of the oral law of the Torah. Jesus tells us that. St. Paul and Jesus himself were very respectful of the Jewish oral law a lot. So the question for us is, did Christianity accept the Jewish oral Torah? Yes and no. And that's because we conflate two things which aren't the same. Jesus accepts the whole Torah of Israel, which doesn't mean he doesn't therefore, therefore um, modify it. He most certainly does. But he accepts it, at least in principle, the entirety of what Israel believed. But you have another thing here, which are really the customs, religious customs developed by, by Jews. Primarily the Pharisees, but not only them that are not actually the oral Torah, although they might be very revered customs. For example, the rosary is not part of big T tradition, but it is certainly part of the little T tradition, the customs, but it's not the word of God. In the same way, Jesus seems to respect the fundamental idea that yes, God revealed these things to Israel in an oral form, and he still accepts that form, but what he refuses to accept is not the customs themselves. Jesus' problem isn't that people have customs. He doesn't like when those customs are practiced bigger than the Torah, written or oral. Right? If we use them to um, get out of doing the word of God because of our customs. Uh, bishop Rahm, who just passed away Monday, um, who was our bishop for 23 years, um, he used to have a saying, he would say, don't major in the minors. And that's what he's talking about. And he talks about the fact that he would know people that would spend thousands of dollars, thousands, to go somewhere in the world where the Virgin Mary might have appeared. But those same people wouldn't spend an hour in adoration where we are definitively certain Jesus is present. Now, he has nothing wrong with apparitions or, or private devotions. Those are fine. His point is this. You better keep things in their right order. Right? The one is the word of God, the very presence of Christ himself. The other one is a big possibility that maybe Mary was there. Right? Even when the church says something's authentic, it doesn't say it's true. It says it just can't prove that it's not true, and there's nothing in it that would make us uncertain the church wary of you following that particular devotion from that apparition but it's not infallible it can't be because it's not a part of the tradition so the point being is we're going to see that jesus has a very similar um, idea that he comes to because when we read what his teachings say and as we understand the culture that jesus is speaking to and then we look at what jesus himself does and then later paul and everything we're going to see that it it's if we identify these two things together, then we're going to come up with a false idea of where Jesus was coming from. Where instead, if we keep these separate, we're able to kind of delineate what Jesus' teaching is to us, which still has very important ramifications to us today, not so much with the Jewish way of doing things, but with our Christian way of doing things. There is a hierarchy of what's more important than others that needs to be kept in mind. Not that you can't do the others, but you need to make sure that the essentials or what are your main focus and your time and effort, et cetera, spiritually. So it's our, our break time. So let's go ahead and take our break, and then we'll come back and um, we'll at least finish the part on the, Christian, the Jewish, our idea of the oral Torah, and then we'll do questions and then see where we go from there. <laughs> so when, when Jesus talks about the burden that, that the Pharisees put the burden on the people, is that kind of similar? Yeah. To... And, the Pharise it, and it's more complicated because Jesus... Um, without rejecting the oral law, Jesus does reject the Pharisees' interpretation of it because part of that burden yeah. is um, the actual oral and written law, only some laws apply to everyone. You know, if you're not a priest, there's hundreds right. of laws that don't apply to you. But the Pharisees made that a, a condition of just being a good Jew. So not only did they choose to take that religious custom themselves, but then they made it to the equal 
of the law of God by saying our interpretation of every Jew has to follow all these laws um, was ridiculous. It, it just didn't make any sense. So. Does that mean they modified it to suit their needs? Um, well, yes and no. They, they, they modified it because clearly if you're not a priest, you can't actually offer sacrifice. So they would do the things like the washing of the hands. These, they would, so they would modify it in the sense that as a lay person, what can I do that kind of symbolizes that? Um, so in that sense, they modified it, but they, of course, didn't expect that the priests would do that. Like, they didn't think they were priests. Uh, so in that sense, it wasn't malicious, but they definitely modified it for a lay person's use. Um, and for that, they didn't have any authority, per se, because that kind of authority, like today, even if we were to modify something like the rosary, that would still have to come from the magisterium, not the average Catholic deciding, I'm going to do what I want with the rosary. So that would be a problem. Yeah. Is, you know, I mean, the Virgin Mary gave a lot of information, supposedly, in the apparitions. And where did that authority come from? Right. Um, I'll talk a little bit about stuff. That's because there's, uh, they're very similar, but there's big T tradition versus little t tradition. And I hate that distinction because I think it's confusing. So I always use the term customs for the little t, so it's more easily... Uh, and we'll, actually, we'll, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, the second one, the distinction you're kind of talking is there is revelation that is public, and that is the only revelation that is required to be saved, that knowledge. Private revelations are never required to be saved, um, but depending on what the specific revelation is, it may... They usually are ones that help people live out the big, the big revelation in a specific manner in a certain time or culture. So, you know, Mary's always asking people to pray more, to do the rosary, to fast on Fridays and Wednesdays. Uh, these are all traditions from the early church and such, but um, they, don't, they don't ever have to be followed to be saved, with one possible exception. The seer themselves... If they're directly told by God, you must do this, for them, it has to be done because that's a direct command from the Lord to them. For other people, it's, it's not required for salvation. So. Well, but she's giving instruction for prayer yeah. to achieve certain results. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I still not need it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that and trying to get the things that Our Lady is warning us about or directing us to, certainly. But are they required for the salvation of any person, per se? Not, not directly, no. Keep seeing the angel with the sword. Right, right. Well, what about the divine chaplets using the rosary as its sword? I mean, as its vehicle, per se, you know, the decades and that. Is that the... Is that pretty consistent, kind of using one mode and then kind of using it for other things also? Is that yeah, and, and, and most of those devotions, most of those other chaplets, the Divine Mercy one, um, there's a, the Seven Sorrows is a slightly different rosary. It actually has seven beads, not ten per thing. But all of those have been at some point brought before the church and, and formally kind of accepted. When we talk about sacramentals, not sacraments, but sacramentals, that's one of the classes we'll talk about all those kind of things and the general idea what kind of power do they actually have how is it different than that of the sacraments um, what are the different types and uh, like there's no list of the sacramentals because the church can create them whenever it wants so there's this, the ones that we're have been around forever you know or the really ancient ones and then there's a lot that are um, always kind of being uh, sort of created, so to speak, for the needs of the church. So. Okay, let's, uh, really quick, I want to turn to the very last page. Um, the last page, 26, the very last thing, I, I just want to make a second um, comment. And that is, again, apologetically, when, when non-Catholics, or I should say when Protestants, because Orthodox, Orthodox churches have the same idea, but when Protestants hear about apostolic tradition, what they generally think of is they're going to go back to Jesus' teachings on religious customs in Israel, which Martin Luther compared to Catholic tradition, but they're completely different things. 
and they're going to assume that these are all kind of man-made stuff we added over time. And we need to recognize what the apostolic tradition is. The apostolic tradition is actually is the gospel. And out of that, it was passed on to the apostles by Christ himself. It's kept secure by the Holy Spirit upon them from Pentecost on. And it is the entirety of what the, the Lord revealed to his church. Over time, some of it comes to be written down and therefore becomes very normative. But the apostolic tradition are not what I like to call customs. Formally, they're called little t traditions, but I think that can be confusing. Um, so I call the little t traditions customs. They've existed from the church from the beginning. Some brought right over from Judaism. Some developed over time in different cultures. Those customs are not themselves the word of God. However, they can help us express and live the word of God, but they still are of the, not the same character. And so the very last paragraph on the entire handout is the church's description and telling us what the difference is. Tradition, big T tradition, is to be distinguished from the various theological, disciplinary, liturgical or devotional traditions born in the local churches over time. These are the particular forms adapted to different places and times in which the great tradition is expressed. In the light of tradition, those big capital T, these little t traditions can be retained, modified, or even abandoned under the guidance of the church's magisterium. So for example, after Vatican II, it was decreed that any devotions must be able to be connected back to sacred scripture. That was Paul VI's decree. And if it could not be, it was not to be promoted. It wasn't abrogated, which means you cannot do it, but it was no longer to be promoted by the official church. So certain versions of the way of the cross had to be brought into a conformity there there's it was just a that's an example of when the church steps in and can um, modify tradition another one is when pope john paul ii added the luminous mysteries right i couldn't have added the luminous mysteries i mean i could do something like that on my own as a spiritual thing and i'm not doing anything wrong but i cannot make that the reality for any catholic who wants to do it only the magisterium can. So John Paul adds mysteries to the rosary. Um, so notice what is not part of the tradition. No theology, no matter how important, is part of the word of God. It helps explain it. It, it helps us understand it, perhaps, or not, depending on the theologian. Um, but none of it is the equal of the word of God. It doesn't matter if it's Aquinas, Augustine, Bonaventure. Every word they say is not the word of God. Some is that they've, that they've explained directly, some is not. So we have to be careful. We can't tie any specific theology as being the word of God. Next, disciplinary things. We are required to obey canon law because the priests have real authority from God, the magisterium, to make rules for the church. But those things are not the word of God. And the church abandons, changes, modifies them all the time. Uh, in fact, we're looking at another huge modification of canon law, it seems, under Francis. We had one with John Paul II. Um, so no disciplinary rules in the sense of the church's rules, not, not like rules that are in Scripture or the tradition as part of the, what you must do. But these are, you know, how is baptism to be celebrated and where does it have to be, those kind of rules. Uh, liturgical or devotional traditions. So devotional traditions are scapulars, like I'm wearing a rosaries, uh, holy water, blessed salt, um, crucifixes, all those kind of things. Any of these traditions and such, and the things that go along with them, um, you know, the promises of the rosary, the promises of the scapular, none of those are part of the big T tradition. And the church doesn't stand behind them with anything more than human faith. What that means is... <laughs> From a human point of view, without divine revelation, we look at these things that these saints have told us and said, and we don't find anything e wrong with them. There's nothing sinful about them. So we recommend that you use them, but we don't guarantee that any of those promises will actually come true. What about indulgences? Indulgences are different because those come directly from the power of the church. 
um, the power of the keys. So when an indulgence is attached to something and you do the action as, as required, then the indulgence will take effect because that's, that's more of the level of the sacraments rather than um, sacramentals. So, and we'll look at that because we'll, um, we'll touch on where a lot of this authority comes from. Okay, so back to our time. Did, did we accept the oral tradition? Well, on the one hand, as I already mentioned, Jesus criticizes the hypocrisy of certain scribes and Pharisees, not all of them, certain ones, who break the Torah precepts, quote, the commandment of God, by focusing instead on devotional religious tradition or practices, the tradition of the elders, which is not the oral Torah per se, so that they have, quote, nullified the word of God for the sake of your tradition. On the other hand, Jesus refers to aspects, Jesus quotes from the oral Torah. In other words, he refers to things that are only found there, so they have to come from there, because we they're in the Talmud and the Mishnah today, but they're nowhere in the Old Testament. And one of it comes directly to when he starts to lay down the authority for the church, first by teaching them of the authority of the, um, the scribes and Pharisees. When he when teaching the crowds that Jesus had come not to abolish the law or the, or the prophets, but to fulfill, so therefore Jesus, we understand, fulfills the whole Torah, not just the written, but the oral as well. He's the fulfillment of everything God revealed. He says this statement, bottom page four, and it carries over. He says, this is Jesus speaking. The scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe all things whatsoever they tell you but do not follow their example. For they preach, but they do not practice. Now it's interesting because Jesus quotes something that is not in the Old Testament. You will never find the chair of Moses in the Old Testament. There's no such thing. The only time he's even referred to as sitting is on a rock when they have to raise his arms up. Where does it come from? It comes from the oral Torah. Right? And it's based on the idea, like I told you, even in, in Catholicism, there must be a, a chair to represent the throne of God that the priest sits in, that John saw in Revelation. So you have the divine throne is kind of the basis for this chair. But it's not found in the Old Testament. You'll never find it. Because it comes from the oral tradition. In fact, it's the very next verse that I didn't quote from the, from the uh, Mishnah that we quoted when we looked at the chain of uh, transmission from Moses to Joshua onward. It's the very next verse it speaks of this. And notice, Jesus quotes it that he agrees, right? He doesn't say they don't have any real authority or they made that one up themselves. He says they do. Therefore, you have to do what they say. So he does claim that it's the same. Now, just to make it clear, when we see the chair in mass, that is, that's a derivative chair of the priest who is really representative of Christ through the bishop. But where the bi what is a bishop's church called? A cathedral. Because the word cathedra means chair. Right? If the Pope declares anything infallible, he must do so from the chair, ex cathedra. When the bishop is proclaiming something for his diocese to follow, he does so from the chair. So it goes back to the chair of Moses, which goes back to the idea of the, God is the one who bestows this ultimate authority. But the point is this. Jesus, this is a pretty important teaching, and yet Jesus clearly has no compunction that this is in any way false. He accepts the oral Torah as much as he does the, um, the written Torah. Now, there's some other examples as well. At the very beginning of St. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew talks about a prophecy from the, quote, prophets, plural, that he shall be called a Nazarene. Nowhere found in the Old Testament. Nowhere found. Not only that, the town of Nazareth is not even listed in the Old Testament ever. So you wouldn't expect the name of someone from there to be there either. So where did that prophecy come from? It's clearly from prophets and such. Well, it's part of the oral tradition again. 
Um, so the Lord, the thing for us as Christians to recognize is Jesus is the fulfillment of the whole Torah. It doesn't matter. Oral written, if there were a billion parts of the Torah, Jesus is the one and only source that fulfills all of them. But he does specifically refer to the fact that the oral Torah is still valid in the sense, at least for Israel, we can discuss how the church understands it later, but from a, a, a passage most people recognize but maybe never fully understood, he says, do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, now we translate it nowadays as not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law. Old translations had that weird phrase, jot and tittle. I don't know where that comes from. I have no idea. But that's the crowns and the cancellation marks. That's the literal word he's referring to. So he literally says, nothing ends until everything in both the oral and written law are finished. Um, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, even the oral ones, and teaches others to do so will be called least of the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So at the very end, Jesus gives us a little twist. He first tells us that we should obey the entirety, at least the Christians of his time. But then at the end, he gives us this twist. And let's first talk about what is he, he mentioning here? Well, there are 613 commands in the Torah. There are 248 positive ones. Things you must do. And there are 365 negative ones. Things you must not do. Of which we still have the understanding, although we don't specifically follow every law. But right, uh, in what I have done, by breaking the ones I shouldn't have done, and in what I have failed to do, the things I was supposed to do and didn't. It's the confidier that we pray. Now, I told you the number stuff, just to get a thing. Eight plus four plus two is what? Fourteen. <laughs> six plus five plus three is fourteen. And then six plus three plus one is ten. So you have two times set. So I'm not going to get into all of it, but what I mentioned, it always comes interconnected. That's why if, it was probably like 20 years ago. Remember they had all those books on the Bible code? To some extent, that's true. I just don't think you can necessarily pull modern historical events out of it like those people did. But it's certainly, when you look within the Bible contained in its own setting, everything is interconnected, everything in it. Um, just the way during Lent when I was showing you that Bonaventure makes everything three. <laughs> threes of threes of threes unendingly for the Trinity in the same way Israel does this. Now, that's the 613 laws. When Jesus at the end says, your, your um, righteousness must surpass them, a lot of times we mistakenly think, some people, some Christians mistakenly think that the reason why the law couldn't save you was because no one could obey it perfectly. That's not true. Um, in the Old Testament alone, there are at least two people who obey it perfectly. In the New Testament alone, there are at least two who obey it perfectly that are called out specifically. One is the rich young man, right? He says, I've done all these things since my youth. And Jesus looked at him with love. Jesus would know, right? He'd be like, come on, you didn't do this one. He doesn't. He said he loved him. He did. He followed all of them. But sort of alluding to what Jesus mentions here about surpassing, remember he asked, what else do I have to do? He gets it. The other one I heard mentioned, Paul. Paul tells us, According to the law, I was blameless. I followed all 613. So it has to be something more than just, it seems that a lot of people can't do it. There has to be something deeper. Well, Jesus' issue with it is not the law itself. It's what the law tends to imply for holiness. The rich young man got it, but remember at the end when confronted with with what he had to do, he couldn't do it, right? He, he couldn't do it. But was that um, part of the law, though? 
Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. And Paul had to have a divine revelation literally strike him to get it. And that is this. The law sets a standard, and once you reach the standard, then what? You can't do anything. Are you, are you now the pinnacle of holiness? Are you sinless? Are you, what does having achieved all 613 on a regular basis actually do? Did it actually change your heart? Externally, doing externals, did it necessarily have any change of who you were? Um, and this is a trap that any Christian can fall into as well. Uh, I do spiritual direction, mostly for the Franciscans, and then I've done a few of the uh, women whose husbands are going through the diaconate process. Um, and a lot of times, you know, at the first interview, I talk about people's, um, uh, their, uh, their religious life, you know. How often do you pray? What's your prayer life consist of? How often do you go to the sacraments? All that kind of stuff. And inevitably, a lot of them, when you ask about confession, you know, how regularly you go to confession, oh, like once or twice a year when, I, when we're required to, I don't really need to go. And I always want to be like, really? So you're so perfect like the Jews, you don't have anything to say? I mean, I'm not saying you're a moral sinner, but you've got nothing? Really? The only time that ever happened, there was a special star in the sky. So we can get into that too, right? We look at the Ten Commandments superficially. We're like, I don't kill anybody. I don't commit adultery. So you're a great person then, right? Maybe you don't commit adultery, but you then come home and never talk to your spouse or are a workaholic to avoid ever having to be home. You've obeyed the law. Are you holy? No. See, what Jesus' issue with it is, he doesn't deny what they do is a great thing, right? You should follow the law. And as Catholics, we're required to follow the whole gospel, the whole teaching of Christ. Um, that was St. Francis's, my founder's, whole concern. When they asked him, you know, what is the law of the Franciscan order? And we do have a rule. But he said, oh, the rule of the Franciscan order is this, to follow the holy gospel according to God in chastity, poverty, and obedience. And the questioners, the cardinals, said, well, okay, sort of generic, because doesn't everyone, all Christians, all religious orders follow the gospel? And Francis' answer was, no, <laughs> almost none of you do. We pick and choose the parts of the gospel we like, and if we don't oppose the others directly, we just ignore the parts we don't like. We're not following the gospel, we're following our opinions and our own likes and dislikes. Follow everything. So that's one thing Jesus is saying. He's not getting us hooked up into the Jewish idea that we have 613 specific laws to do. But are we constantly open to learning more about the gospel, accepting it, and then putting it into practice? And that goes to the deeper level of what Christ is concerned with. Our ultimate understanding and our ultimate goal is love, right? Caritas, agape love. The standard of love has no limit. You will never love enough in the right way all the time, right? It always is there to be expanded upon. Unlike this, where I can reach a point and become very complacent, not only complacent, oftentimes those people who do very well spiritually speaking, at least pass through a phase that they have to really struggle against self-righteousness because the idea then becomes, well, look at that guy. He's failing. I can do it. And, and you always do it as if you were like, as if you were humble, right? Well, if I can do it and I suck, they should be able to. But what you're really doing is saying they're a total failure, right? They can't do what I do. And so everything about this is very problematic if that's our spiritual sort of way of approaching our relationship with God. But if it's love, then there's never going to be a standard. I could do all 100, 613, and yet I've still only begun. I've just begun, right? And that's what the young, rich young man kind of focused too. We focused on what he had to give up, the money. But really the point was, give up the money and do what? Follow, Follow me. He was actually calling him to be an apostle, and the rich young man denied it. No. Other rich people follow Jesus. Matthew, rich, he was a tax collector. Judas has a last name. He had to have been rich. 
come from a wealthy family. The fishermen, Mary Magdalene, the fishermen weren't poor. They owned a fishing business. Remember Peter and James and John. So they gave up things as well. Peter even says that at one point, remember? When he starts getting a little nervous, he's like, Lord, we gave up everything, you know? <laughs> Houses, in fact, what do we get? And so, but the idea of love, right? So in this sense also, realize this in your, in your spiritual journey. There is nothing wrong, and in fact, it should be the case that you always feel a little unsettled. You should always feel that I haven't completed. I haven't done enough. I haven't done that. Not to make you feel bad about yourself, but just it's that you're starting to recognize the fact that what you're shooting for, in a sense, is unattainable. But you still have to keep moving in that direction until the beatific vision where you see love and experience love literally face to face that'll come to, you know, you'll share in that whole divine nature, as Peter says. But so we should always feel a little unsatisfied or dissatisfied with our spiritual life. We should, even when we're doing good. Now you can feel dissatisfied because you're not doing well, right? When you're like, oh, I really should start praying. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's a bad thing. You should pray. But you could be praying regularly very well and still feel like, my prayer life's not there. Because grace is not emotions. Grace cannot be felt, per se, unless God gives you some special reason to do so. Uh, the Catechism itself says grace escapes all of the senses. The only way you can know it's working on you is kind of hindsight and looking back. Um, a lot of times you'll also have it in the negative sense. What I mean by that is you'll build up a habit of, say, daily prayer or whatever it is. And you're kind of just going along, you know, at first it's really exciting, and then you reach a point, you're not necessarily in like spiritual darkness or anything, but you're just going along, right? It's become so easy, like, I do my morning prayers, I do my rosary at three, or whatever your thing is, and you've got it down. Um, and you're kind of moving along, moving along, and you just kind of suddenly realize that um, it's not doing it for you, it seems. And so what happens is you start to get a little proud of yourself, right? I'm obeying the law. I'm doing all these things. God really digs me right now. And so you start getting a little lazy about it. So now I don't do my prayer life. And now I let like a, an hour of the day go. And then it becomes a few days. Then all of a sudden, all the bad stuff in life, which was always there before, hits you hard. And you realize in the negative sense, wow, I was getting so much out of prayer I didn't realize, and only when I stopped praying regularly does the world fall apart around me. Now I see that grace was at work all that time. Because nothing's different except my prayer life, right? The same issues were swirling around me, the same things are going on. So sometimes a lot of us as human beings, we just, we're too dense. We can't get it until it's the negative, right? And then we're like, oh, it was doing something. I just didn't, I didn't feel anything. But now when I see the consequences of having not doing it anymore, I realize what grace did for me. So Jesus accepts the oral law, but at the same time, he already lays the seeds for the fact that for the whole Torah, written and oral, it's become focused on something very different, very different. The other thing about love is love can't be... Can, Love doesn't have a limit in the ways it can be expressed in the sense of the law, right? The law has rules. You do this and this and this. But Jesus would say, well, love goes beyond that, right? And that's a lot of the examples of his life. Um, they'll become a conflict in the rules. And Jesus naturally, as God, knows which one is more important. It's the one that deals with love. And so, the, and, and it's funny because the Jewish law itself is, is if there's a conflict between two commandments, there is a hierarchy you're supposed to have. But for whatever reason, the Pharisees don't seem to agree to that. So they, cru they crucify Jesus literally, but I mean, they get angry at him because he heals a person on the Sabbath. Right. And then remember, he refers to them, he says, but the, Sab the, the Sabbath, you're even allowed to save animals. So you can't save a human being? Right, so they're not, they're letting sort of legalism sort of cloud the bigger reality. And so it's not that he says, that Jesus says you shouldn't have to, you should just ignore all the Sabbath laws, but he's saying, look, love is the ultimate one, right? Love overcomes any other Sabbath law. 
should be the case when necessary. So Jesus both plants the seeds of what will be Christianity and how different we are from our Jewish forebears, while at the same time accepting the idea, the whole understanding of what's going on um, with the Torah as having really being the word of God and such. Um, now, Paul has a similar thing. Oh, the, the other one. The other big oral tradition from the Torah is one of the most central things in Catholicism, the Eucharist. If you go back and you read the Passover account in Exodus, it will basically, I think, give you four parts. You kill the lamb, you put the blood of it on the doorposts, you eat the lamb with bitter herbs, and you dress as if you're going to uh, uh, run away quick, and even your bread should be baked so it's easily take, you can easily take it with you. That's all you'll learn from Exodus. So how is it that Jesus knows that there are four cups of wine that you actually eat the bread there, not after, as the Exodus seems to imply, the words to pray, like how does he know any of the other stuff? Well, because Jews to this day, it's still the oral Torah, right? That's the oral Torah. So it's ironic that one of our most central things as Christians, the Last Supper, the Seder meal is entirely Jewish tradition. And that's what Jesus uses to even reflect what he's doing in fulfilling the Passover meal on the cross, right? By drinking the last cup at the moment of death, by singing the Hillel Psalms. None of these things are in the Old Testament. Uh, but all Je if you went to a Seder today, all Jews would be doing them. So Jesus, uh, one of our big things, he pulls from that as well. Now, Jesus also expects that we really do obey these different rules. Uh, and it's not that we have to be as legalistic about it as having 613 rules. Instead, as Christians, we should understand it in the broad sense that we're really supposed to obey the entire gospel in so much as we're able and it comes into our lives. Because he has another teaching where he's condemning the scribes and Pharisees, but it doesn't end the way we might think at first. At the top of page six, about uh, three lines down, he says, quote, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier things of the law, judgment and mercy and fidelity. So let's stop there. So Jesus tells us that there is a hierarchy, clearly. The weightier things, the more important things like judgment and mercy and fidelity are more essential and primary. Other things like paying tithes, are secondary and really ways to live up to the first level of, of um, uh, laws. So you would think the way it's going that Jesus is going to say, do these and not these. He says exactly the opposite. Look at the last sentence. But these, the three, the essentials, judgment, mercy, fidelity, these you should have done without neglecting the others. You don't get to not do the others. You do them as well. In other words, their problem wasn't that they um, only neglected something. It's that they didn't do everything they were supposed to do. James repeats that teaching in his own way. If you look at footnote 41, James says, quote, If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls short in one particular has become guilty in respect to all of it. We don't like that as people, but God is very clear. It's all or nothing. He doesn't take half measures. Right? Jesus condemns those who are lukewarm as some of the worst people in the book of Revelation. That we really need to live. And as Christians, it's not some specific set of rules per se, the way it was in Israel. For us, it's just we really have to, our whole life has to really um, be focused ultimately in some way on our final goal on what we're doing this for, on who we're doing this for, on living this life of love, of celebrating the sacraments worthily, of doing these things, of, of helping those in need. And so it's really to take on the whole understanding of the gospel that Jesus is, is more concerned with rather than us getting caught up in this specific law, that specific law. So basically we could say three things about Jesus. 
page 7. One, Jesus accepts the whole Torah of Israel, written and oral, clearly. So he accepts the whole Jewish understanding and tradition that has come down to him. Number, second, he clearly points that if any issue arises between a, a law of the Torah and a religious custom, the Torah must always win. If the law, if the issue is between two laws of the oral law, not any custom, then the one that's more closer to love, fidelity, etc., that one wins. And then finally, even religious customs, Jesus does not wholesale condemn there when he con convicts the Pharisees. He doesn't convict them of the custom. He convicts them of how they're using it. So he does not deny the validity of any religious custom. He only refuses to allow to you for you to allow any religious practice to validate or invalidate or hinder you from practicing the actual Torah. In fact, Jesus himself follows a lot of these customs. For example, we know he wore tassels on his cloak, which the woman with the hemorrhage touched. That's a Jewish custom to this day, the talit that hang off the, the shawls. Um, he fasted voluntarily. There's only one day you are required to fast for Israel ever, Yom Kippur. All any other fasting is voluntary. Now, a lot of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and John's disciples did fast. Remember, Jesus' disciples even come up to him and go, how come you don't make us fast? Everybody else fasts. And his answer is, oh, you'll fast just later when you see why. In fact, the way that the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel are written, chapters 5, 6, and 7, chapter 5 starts with the Beatitudes, and then for the rest of chapter 5, Jesus gives his interpretation, his authoritative interpretation of the Torah. So that's where he modifies the Torah as the only one who can or explains it, God. In chapter 6, Jesus does something interesting in that he takes certain Jewish religious customs, not the oral law, customs, and he actually makes them part of Christian big T tradition. Fasting, prayer, almsgiving. In the way he's talking about it is the way it was done by the Pharisees, and that's why he refers to the Pharisees in each of those. Right? They do it on street corners, you're to do it this way. They do it this way. But those, although there is fasting, like I said, the one day of Yom Kippur, and of course there's prayer, but there's never any rules of prayer in the Old Testament given. And there are ties that are required, but these are voluntary alms, which are not required under the law. So Jesus even takes part of the customs and actually makes them part of the Christian law, which means that those were always something that God had understood as being um, so important. Now, turning to Paul really quickly, Paul was a Pharisee. He was trained in the oral law. In fact, I talked about there are 13 principles of interpretation. Paul uses them in his letters. He never refers them by name, by what, but what he does shows that he uses them. And in the time when he lived and they lived, both inside of the Holy Land and outside, all pious Jews followed, quote, the customs Moses handed down to us. It's from the book of Acts. Now, Paul also has teachings that are from the oral Torah. And like Jesus, I'm only going to pick two so we don't get too bogged down. Page eight. The, the first one is, when he's writing to Corinthians, Paul suddenly tells this weird story. He tells us a story about the Exodus and the rock, and that's, fam and that's famous. We know that story. It occurs twice, two times where Moses hits a rock and water comes out. I mean, that story is in the Bible. But then he tells us that the rock followed the people of Israel around, constantly giving them water for the rest of the 40 years. Oh, yeah. Not only is it really weird, but you're like, that's not in the Bible, but it's in the oral tradition. And then he actually goes forward beyond the oral tradition and says, and the rock was Christ. So here he's referring to it. The other one is a very minor point, but it's interesting. He gives us the names of the two magicians from Egypt who oppose Moses. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, again, you will not find their names anywhere. You don't know how many magicians there were, except that there have to be at least two, because it's plural. But yet, he refers to them as Yanis and Yambres. He knows their names. Yeah, because it's in the Jewish oral Torah. So, Paul uses the oral Torah as well without really thinking, and if we just 
do a cursory sweep of the rest of the New Testament. St. James refers to an incident in the life of the prophet Elijah, not found in the Bible, but found in the oral tradition. St. Peter describes the imprisonment of the angels at the time of the flood, not mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in the Old, not mentioned in the Old Testament, but in the sacred tradition. St. Jude does a lot. He tells us all these stories about Enoch from the oral Torah. He tells us a story about Michael and Satan battling over Moses' body from the oral Torah. And he also refers to the punishment of the angels that St. Peter talked about showing that the oral Torah was respected and used by Jesus and the apostles because they saw it was part of divine revelation. Now, how do modern day Christians, Catholics, see the oral Torah? Well, our idea would be this. When Jesus sets the apostles forth with Peter with the power of the keys and the other 12 or the other 11 with the power to bind and loose, and then their successors continue through history, they, they inherit the entire power from Israel. They inherit the entire way, the authority to um, interpret and understand both the oral and written tradition of Israel, as well as that which Christ proclaims. So for the most part, generally speaking, much of the, tr of the Torah, even the written part, as well as the oral, most of it we use in a symbolic sense. What I mean by that is most of the laws we do not abide by anymore because we don't need to. But we still use those laws and rules and stories in order to teach us principles that remain solid for all Catholics forever. Because, so we, we use them for their principle and their, what's called their topology, what they show us about Jesus and such. But we don't literally obey almost any of the old Jewish covenant anymore. So as time has gone on and Jesus passes that chair of Moses' power really on to the apostles, uh, most of those have in history just sort of fallen away because they weren't needed as the church became more Gentile, as Paul started to reach out. Um, because if we, and again, a smaller point, if we only had the Bible, we would still have to be doing things that no Christian I know does except maybe really weird groups. For example, when Paul is arguing that we should allow Gentiles to be part of the church, and the argument is not whether they can be. The argument is whether they need to obey the whole Jewish law or not. And in the end, Paul's argument wins out. And Peter stands for it as well, and even James. But when James tells them what the Gentiles have to do, there are still certain rules. One of the rules Gentiles are supposed to do who are Christian is that they cannot eat meat with blood in it. Even Now, nowhere in the Bible is that overturned. So why are, are we all sinners? Because we haven't obeyed James in the council of, the first council of the church that said we all have to eat, we can never eat meat with blood in it, period. No, because over time the church can modify and change its own rules. But if we only had the Bible, I mean, it's always fun to ask someone, so why do you eat meat with blood in it, right? It says right there you can't. It's never changed anywhere because that occurs after Jesus with the whole clean foods thing. This is a whole different prohibition. So it, we just take it for granted so much that, is, um, that the oral tradition gives us, we don't even realize it. Um, let's go ahead and, and let's stop here for a moment because the next part is looking at what Jesus himself did and then the, how the apostles take that and see if there's any, um, do questions or comments or anything from everyone. Mm -hmm. I have lots. But <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Nobody else does. Uh, you just mentioned about the the bloody meat. I think it was my mother used to have the belief that we could not eat meat that crawled. Snakes or put it down. Oh, right. Or yeah. Or things of that. That, that's in the Old Testament. Um, I don't know of any specific Christian group, but I, I could be entirely wrong who does that. But it is a law from the Old Testament. Now, let me give you an example, a real life example from history that's a weird one. Um, Obviously, there's polygamy in the Old Testament. And there was technically even polygamy at the time of Jesus. It just wasn't as widespread anymore. And monogamy had kind of become the, the general for most, most Jewish couples. Now, Jesus gives the whole talk on not divorcing your wife. And he certainly appeals to the, the story back in Genesis where man and woman are one flesh. 
and that doesn't make sense on the surface logically if you have one man and three women you know or do you all become one flesh it kind of gets weird so there, it's implied in his teaching that monogamy is is there and that's how the church always understood it now at the very beginning of the Reformation, we're talking the first five years. So the Reformation actually begins in 1521. The Protestants mark it 1517. It's actually 1521. That's the point which Luther is excommunicated. At that point, he's no longer Catholic. Um, one of the German princes is not really one way or the other. He's just not a religious man, but he sees an opportunity for both himself and Luther. And his, what he tells Luther is this. Look, here's the deal, Luther. I'll become Lutheran and my whole principality with me if you can answer me this question. He says, I have this wife who I love. I forget her name. I think her name was Christine of Savoy. And he, he uh, describes her in really weird terms. He's like, she's faithful, fertile, and fat. So what's the deal? Well, now I found another princess I want to marry. I don't want to divorce my first wife. So this is not Harry or Henry VIII. I don't want to divorce Christine, but I'd like to marry the other one, right? We're talking about polygamy. Mm -hmm. What's Luther's answer? Why not? It never specifically says it in the Bible. And in fact, a lot of people in the Bible are polygamists. Now, to the Lutheran's credit, after Luther died, that never happened again. But it was such a glaring, strange thing because Luther was following his own rule. If it's not in the Bible, then it's not mandatory or whatever. And since polygamy is allowed in the Old Testament, Jesus never formally condemns it. You never see it directly mentioned in the New Testament as being mandatory. Luther's thinking was, therefore, you can. Now, I, even Lutherans, like I said, immediately after his death, even they realized, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. That's a tradition of the church will accept, <laughs> like, even though we won't claim it as that. But... Um, so it can get weird. So it sounds like your mom, like probably reading the Old Testament, is reading some of the food laws. And just as a Christian, or maybe whatever church you guys belong to or anything, maybe that was, that was put forth. I mean, is it the Jehovah's Witnesses who also kind of follow the Seventh-day Adventists? Okay. So, you know, they, they're... No right, no coffee. And they worship on Saturday, I believe, the mm -hmm. Sabbath. They don't consider the Sunday to be holy. Again, it, 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 it's this idea of a very literal reading of the text without any of the, the apostolic tradition or often even any context historically to like ground it. And so you've got, we do have these groups of Christians, most of them aren't the major Christian groups, but have very odd ideas. But they're only odd when you realize that they're coming from the Bible, but just things that through the life of the, the, the Catholic Church as it went through the centuries clearly had already answered and taken care of. So um, any other, what's your second one? Or you said it, you well, and along the same lesson, are the salt, the blessed salt, will any priest bless salt and what is it used for? Uh, priests will bless salt. We'll talk about that in sacramentals. Um, well, in the old days, sac uh, blessed salt was used, you bless salt first and then you bless holy water with the salt. Um, and so originally it was used in the Easter vigil and in every Christian baptism, that you would bless the salt, and then he would pour the salt in the in the sign of a cross in the water. Uh, salt generally has stuff that has to do with, and, and the reason for that is that's part of the exorcism that a baptism is. So salt has a long-standing tradition, uh, covenants of salt are from the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus talks about being the salt of the earth. So it goes back a, a long way to being um, a something that, is for whatever reason very um, powerful to use against demons and their presence around you. Um, and two, on the more positive side, salt is something that sort of is preservative. So it's indicative of fidelity and, and holding true. So the church still blesses salt. It's not as openly used in our sacraments because the new rite of baptism does not use it. Um, there's, still a, a, there's still a prayer for blessing salt in the book of blessings. So generally speaking, a priest would have no reason he wouldn't do it. Uh, I'm not going to therefore say any priest will, but um, they shouldn't have any problem doing it. There's a blessing for salt. And when people do do it, they either put it in their holy water font, some people put it around their house or the doors, the door entrances. 
Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's a legitimate one. We'll actually talk about that one in sacramentals. Mm -hmm. oh. Any other Yeah. When Jesus was turning over the tables in the, in the temple and the, and the bystanders kind of quoted, saying that his, for his verb for his house, was yeah. that an oral tradition or was it? No, that one, uh, that one comes from... From Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah. I'm not sure. But yeah, that one's from the written tradition. So, yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff we get um, explain a lot of the oral tradition of Judaism. It's really interesting. You can buy just a book called um, Legends of the Jews. Now, the, the whole set of it is five volumes long. It's expensive. But you can buy a one-volume abridged version and for probably like 20 bucks probably cheaper on Amazon, Lewis Ginsburg did it. And what he did is he combed through all those Talmuds and he pulled out the narrative stories that further explained the biblical stories. It's all going to be Old Testament, of course, but it, it, it is really interesting. Like in the Jewish conception, Adam was not the only person created. There were lots of humans. That's why when, that's why when Cain leaves, he's afraid of other human beings. Because Adam was just like Noah in the sense that a covenant person is just the one whose actions will determine that of the entire group. And so they have the stories of these other people and stuff that Adam is just the leader of. And therefore, when he falls, the whole human race falls with him because like Christ, he's kind of, they are in a body with him. And he has stories about Noah and Moses and um, all these additional things that are interesting because sometimes, not a lot of times, but sometimes in the New Testament, they'll, pre they'll assume those ideas and say something. And it, it won't be enough that it catches most people's attention, but if you read closely, they'll say things that you're like, well, that's, that's not something I remember from the story. Well, because it's part of the oral tradition that was then later written down about a lot of these heroes and, and such that through the, the history. So it's kind of a fun read and it's fun because it's stories. Like you don't have to slog through laws and rules and things. It's just the stories. Um, what did God create on each day? Why did he do this? On what day did he create the demons? On what, what existed before he created the first word? seven things the torah the altar the flame of light like all these different they're just it's very interesting stuff because it kind of corresponds then back to a lot of um what the new testament uh understands about uh its faith as well so okay well we've reached the end guys but let's go ahead and end in prayer we will continue this one next week so try to keep your hand out if you have one um, I will have, there will still be a few extras, but try to remember to bring it back. And we'll finish next week, which will complete both oral tradition and the papacy. And so then the next one will be on the sacraments and then the sacramentals. So um, we're moving from like just a basic practice, the sign of the cross, to the source of our church's faith, the Bible, and the oral tradition. And then next we're going to be talking about worship and devotion. And then there's only the one on, uh, then there's Mary and the Saints and Purgatory. So that kind of where we're heading. So let's go ahead and begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty and ever living God, we come before your throne of majesty, Lord, able to appear before you face to face by the power of your spirit and the sacrifice of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom flesh we pass as like a veil, the author of Hebrews tells us, to stand before you. So Lord, we come before you and we ask you to continue to have mercy on us, to draw us ever closer to you in the bonds of love, and to help us understand and appreciate evermore all the gifts you have given to us as Catholics. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life that you gave us to bring us forth because out of your love, we thank you for the grace of Christ and our redemption in him, which allows for that life to reach its pinnacle and to know and experience and love you. And we look forward in hope, Lord, to the final culmination that after our physical death will be renewed, restored, and resurrected to share that same life of love with you forever. And so knowing this, Lord, we ask you to give us the zeal to live out the gospel and our Catholic faith as authentically as possible so that we may become the salt of the world and the light of the world and the salt of the earth to begin to draw people once more to the glory of Christ and bring us one step closer as we can to the kingdom of God, which in the end you will fulfill for all 
of creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.